The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Welcome, Full Stature Ministries Kingdom Life Church. Uh, I, I just love what God's been speaking lately uh, with Jennifer. Matter of fact, I've never heard anybody else teach that. But uh, we're walking in that relationship. You know, it's one thing to learn about the different names of God and the different attributes. But God challenged me as a baby Christian, and I guess this is how we became the how-to people, apart from the gifting that God's given us was that God said, every revelation you get is not information, revelation, where he reveals himself through his word. Every revelation needs to be cultivated, and then you check yourself out to see if what was cultivated actually bore fruit. Revelation, cultivation, fruit. And really, that that would be healthy for all Christians because uh, it's easy to get lazy and get born again, legitimately born again, and then camp out there the rest of your Christian life. And people do do that because they feel like I've learned more and more about God. Well, everything we are going to emphasize this morning and actually any message we've ever given uh, is how do I do that? How do I make that an experience? How do I experience the Word of God? It's a living Word, right? And Jennifer taught a series, we have a booklet out pretty soon on it, uh, Jesus as our promised land. And I never really heard that taught before. I understand the concept, but it was so beautiful. It was so rich. Jesus as our promised land. And it, the beauty of it is, is everything that depicts the promised land depicts aspects of Jesus. I mean, I thought it was great just the land flowing with milk and honey. But milk represents there's cattle in this land. There's grass to grow because cattle have to feed on grass. Honey means there's flowering plants and there's bees that are interacting with the creation. And it's a land flowing milk and honey. And it just goes on and on and on. And that Jesus, ultimately, what you'll get out of it is he's your all in all. Isn't that the bottom line? Walk in that relationship of Jesus as your thing. But this morning, I'm going on my tangent of what God's been speaking to me personally. And that is the Genesis face. The Genesis face. Genesis means the beginning. You know, we know the book of Genesis is the book of beginnings. But this Genesis face, <clears throat> I want to read to you out of John chapter 1, verse 5. Uh, in the expanded Bible. This is a translation that's relatively new, isn't it, Jennifer? But anyway, uh, it's kind of like the Amplified Bible. It's called the Expanded Bible. Uh, John 1, 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overpowered, defeated, understood, comprehended it. I've always loved that when that was taught uh, years ago to me as a baby Christian that this light shines in darkness but darkness can't overpower it it doesn't understand it and there's scripture after scripture that reiterates the same concept I, I love that in in the judges when they had the pitchers and the torches and they're in the midst of the enemy confrontation and they smashed the pit light shined in darkness and boom the enemy got confused so they really don't understand they get defeated they can't comprehend. They get defeated because light shines in darkness and it dispels darkness. Darkness can't stop it. It can't defeat it. It loses. As a matter of fact, in that darkness, they usually turn on themselves. You know how many times in Scripture the enemy turned on themselves? They're confused. Now, he wants you to be a product of that character and that nature, and I don't want anybody confused you. <laughs> I, want, I want that light to shine on our hearts as it's shown in the face of Jesus. Now, John 1, 4, and 5. I'm going to give it an additional verse there. In him, in him, there was life, or what was made through him was life, and that life was the light of all people. 
Light shines in darkness, and the darkness is not overpowered, defeated, or understood, or comprehended it. You see, this light is just not intellectual understanding. This light has a spiritual application that actually dispels the darkness. As a matter of fact, we're, we were to have dominion. We were created, predestined to have dominion over creeping things, right? Anybody felt like a creep ever? Well, God gave you dominion over that creepy things. <laughs> so don't give in to it. So you're not a creep. I'm a child of God. All right. But here, here's the context of, of what God's been speaking, and it just thrills my heart to cover this today. James 1, verses 22 to 25. James chapter 1. A familiar portion of Scripture, but nonetheless, but here's what really stood out. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So there's a doing of the word as opposed to just saying, mm, yeah, I heard that before. Uh, hearers only, deceiving. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. That natural face is a Genesis face. That's the actual interpretation of that. You look it up. The natural man is the Genesis face, the face of your birth. But a man observing his natural face in a mirror, he observes himself and goes away and immediately forgets the kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, and here's the key, and continues in it, He's not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. So, you know, what is a mirror? Isn't that a unique reflection, a mirror? And you look at your natural face in the mirror of God's word. And if you allow it to not just think, but drink, if not just read, but feed, you are literally allowing that light to shine and any darkness in your heart. And it will dispel it. And it's superior too because the darkness doesn't understand. It gets comprehended. It gets confused. Well, fine. That's darkness. We don't want to live there. But if any man would observe his Genesis face as in a mirror, now it says if he goes away, all right, but it says if he would look into it continually, and this is the way I discipled Jennifer. Jennifer had all the right answers in her head when we first got married. All right? She knew the Bible inside out and backwards. She was a real student of the Word and a theologian. Uh, yet when I said, when you read the Word, you're not reading it for just mental understanding. You're reading, you're feeding. And the goal is, I want to experience that Word. I want to look into the mirror of the Word, and while I'm reading, you still don't throw your intellect away, but while I'm reading... I'm yielding and drinking in. I use the word cherish what I'm reading, and that didn't translate. Jennifer says, oh, I get it. Absorb. If you would absorb while you read, you're like prayer reading, reading and praying at the same time. You're not just, it's not just the intellect alone. It has to be experience. And for it to be experience, you have to be yielded and learning to yield from your heart. Not here. Here. You yield while you're reading, you're giving space or opportunity for the Holy Spirit to write on the tablet of your heart. You see no scriptures written on the tablet of your heart. That's not poetry. As far as I'm concerned, there are levels of understanding in the Word of God, and these levels were meant to be pursued. And I think you could stop at just the intellectual level of understanding, saying, oh, I know what the Bible says about the, uh, this ch uh, chapter and that chapter. And you can explain it real well. You know, there's theologians that are not even saved. So I'm not real impressed with that concept. What I am impressed is how much of what you know do you know experientially. Uh, it would be kind of like the Wesleyan quadrilateral. Uh, the only mistake you could make with the Wesleyan quadrilateral is treating all four areas equal. No, no. The Word of God is supreme. But the Word of God, I want to know... Was it in the book of Acts? Did the early church do it? I want to know, can I experience this for myself? I want to experience the Word of God. I don't want to just know it. And so the Word is the 
preeminent uh, focal point. God is preeminent in this. But in James 1.22, I think we've overlooked that. When a man looks at his Genesis face, the face of his birth, what is a mirror but a unique reflection, correct? Uh, the Genesis face. I'm looking at, I can remember a time when, uh, this is a long time ago, so I must really look like him. I remember the time I looked into the mirror and I said, I can see my dad. <laughs> All right. Well, didn't Jesus say something similar? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. All right. There is... There is what, what God says, uh, and it starts in a process. First, it's an imprint. <laughs> then it's a representation. And then there's a manifestation. So God intended for us to look into the mirror of the word and grow, right? He expected change or transformation. He didn't expect just more knowledge. He expected you to move in character and the essence. Now, let me explain... <clears throat> You like that? Looking into the mirror of the Word. And by the way, if a light shines in darkness, the next time you're in, your script, in the Scriptures, and whether it's those little uh, what we call railroad track Scriptures, the ones you wrote in your Bible when you first got saved, but you never lost your special love for certain Scriptures, that might be God's railroad track for you that when you get a little off, off base, go back to that and go deeper in it. Uh, Mine was always, and I can see how it bore fruit over the years, mine was always Philippians 3.10, particularly in the Amplified, where it says, that I might know him, that I might progressively, ah, see there, that I might progressively become more intimately acquainted with all the wonders of his person. Well, we've been walking lately in the wonders of Jesus being our promised land and understanding all, all of the things in the scripture, there's levels of it that it's not poetry. There's things about barley. There's things about wheat. There's things about uh, milk and honey. There's things about that aren't just trying to be flowery about it. They're meant for our experience and our insight into Jesus, who is our all in all. And yes, he is the promised land. And even in the promised land, did they not have to go through battles? Right? Flesh lusts against the spirit. But God's saying, I'm telling you that right now what he's speaking is people are going to have to start looking into the mirror of the word and, and see what image is being reflected and remove the darkness. Let light remove the darkness. Because uh, in the beginning, Genesis 1.26, when he says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Image had to do with the expression, uh, the, the appearance, the essence. And likeness had to do with action or demonstration. And that's one of the chief, chief truths that God gave me years ago, where he says, when this gospel of the kingdom is preached throughout all the earth, he said, no, no. He always laid it on my heart. When this gospel of the kingdom is demonstrated throughout all the earth, there's a big difference between lip service and demonstrating something. And God's intent was that we were created in the image of God, in his image and in his likeness, so that we would have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and the cattle over all the earth and over creepy. Oh, yeah, see, there it is. We have, we're supposed to have dominion over every creepy thing. All right, don't be calling people names now. You're supposed to have dominion over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. All right? Now, when he, when he made us, he spoke to himself. Let us create man in our image. We are made after his kind. And God is looking for a people that will reproduce according to kind. You, can, you can't reproduce something that you don't have. You can't give something you don't have. If you're going to reproduce, you're going to reproduce according to your kind to the degree that you've allowed God to change and transform you. But image and likeness. And we know that this image was marred through Adam's sin, correct? That was the marring of that beautiful image of God walking in the cool of the day in the garden in communion and union. And sin entered in and put a separation Sin separated, but the image was restored through Jesus. So now, the second thing. First, 
were created in the image. It's about eight, eight, or, eight or ten or twelve or twenty things I'm going to share today. <laughs> but one is we were created in the image of God. But ultimately, what I want to get you to do in the, the end of the story, in the beginning, is get you looking into the mirror of the Word and see the kind of person you are. The, you know, uh, gifting and discernment is a wonderful thing, but I'll tell you what, you know where it started? It started with the Word discerning you. Before you go discerning anybody else, let the Word discern you. All right? The Word of God is quick and powerful, a sharper than a two-edged sword. And it divides asunder between soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It'll, it'll tell you this is flesh, this is spirit. It'll tell you here's where you're not joined properly in the body, joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And then the beautiful, most beautiful verse after 12 is 13 where it says, And all things are naked and open to the eyes of him. See, that's a living word. That's Jesus. Jesus and his word are one. Now, all right. I have to get back to the other 20 things. Number one, you were created in the image of God. And the thing you need to know there is in his image and his likeness. In other words, in his essence and his function or demonstration. Be and do. Being, of course, is more important than the doing. But the doing is to function. You know, if you're really functioning as a believer uh, with Jesus as Lord, you function as a Sabbath son. A Sabbath son or daughter is one who is walking in the supernatural peace of God that is guarding their heart and their mind, but it's also allowing Jesus to be ruling in your life. Let the peace of God rule. That's experiential. That's not a concept. When peace is ruling in your heart, he's ruling. He's Lord, not just your Savior. He's Lord at that point in time. Now, if you were created in the image of God, we need to know two things that uh, we are an expression of him and we are to function the way he functioned in obedience to his father. You know, even in the Didache, before they had a New Testament, they would teach these, these Gentiles who had no Old Testament background. They had no background, but they were coming to Jesus and they taught him there's two ways to live. There's a way of life and the way of death. And great is the chasm between the two. So much for gray areas, huh? I think the church today could use that one. There's a path of life and the path of death. And then they even cheat in the Bible. They tell you, choose life, <laughs> right? And great is the chasm between the two. And what did they tell these new, these new converts in the Didache? They knew they had no Old Testament. They didn't have any Ten Commandments. They didn't even know what that stuff was. All they knew is their heart was open to this new Messiah, this Jesus that was being preached by the disciples in the apostles' teaching and the apostles' doctrine. And what did they hear? They heard, you shall love the Lord your God who made you. I always thought that was a beautiful way of describing to Gentiles they couldn't say the God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. That would be talking only to Jewish people. But these Gentiles were suddenly coming to Jesus, and they were saying, you shall love the Lord your God. This is the first and foremost thing, and you will love him with all of your heart and all your soul, the God who made you. Now, they may have come from a culture where there was ten gods, you know, uh, or more than one for sure. Now, the first part is God was created you in the image. The second truth that needs to be digested after that and experienced is that you have the capacity to choose the image. Isn't that nice? God gave you the ability to choose. Choices. <laughs> Romans 1, 21 to 23. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Where did they get dark? Foolish thinking up here, but the darkened heart here. This is where the light was supposed to shine, in the darkness. But their foolish hearts were darkened, professing to be wise, they exalted the intellect and reason. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God 
into an image like corruptible man, birds, four-footed animals, and creeping things. That shows you where the intellect will get you without God, won't it? In other words, we were to have dominion over the creepy things, and if you choose to reject God, you have the creepy things having dominion over you. Wow, that's saying a lot for your intellectual prowess. Huh? You chose the dominion of creeping things. You know, there, there was an actual case where a judge, someone was suing, they wanted a holiday for the atheists. This is a real thing. At least it was real when I read it. I don't know if it's real. But the judge said, you already have a holiday. And they go, no, we, all these Christian holidays we, and Jewish holidays, and we, we want our atheist holiday. And she said, you already have one. She says, the atheists already have a holiday, April Fool's. <laughs> she said, and then she quoted the scripture. She said, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. There you go. There's your holiday, April Fool's. Okay, but anyway. But when you choose an image, you have the capacity to choose an image. And I'd like to see a, uh, the church really get ministered to in false personalities because there are things that you say is me because you have a long history, but it doesn't line up with the new creation reality. If a, if a so-called image doesn't line up with the new creation reality, it's darkness. I don't care how you could have affirmed it and confirmed it and said, that's just the way I am. I've heard that my whole life. People have bought into darkness as opposed to the Word of God that they're supposed to be looking into that mirror and not walking away and being a forgetful here, but looking into that mirror of the Word and be transformed. Feed instead of just read. Drink instead of just think. Now, to choose an image... It's apparent, John 3.19. It says, remember Jesus is called the light of the world? In, in John 3.19, it says, light has come into the world, but people chose darkness because their deeds were evil. Evil people will make excuses rather than deal with their darkness. And guess what? You have a free will. You can choose that darkness. You can either choose for forgiveness and repentance and come to the light, or you can choose the darkness and make an excuse. God can't heal excuses, but people somehow, you can either run from the light or you can run to the light. And my suggestion is, just like life and death, choose life. Run to the light. Now, wherever or however God reveals himself, we are presented with a choice. And... There's a clear, clear warning that if you choose an image, what's another way of saying uh, a false image, an idol? And there's a strong warning in Exodus 20. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself any graven or carved image. Now, people in the olden days actually had paid people to make them little, little idols little dumb idols because <laughs> they couldn't talk or do anything and they were made in the image of some creepy thing, right? Might even been made in the image of man. Some say Nebuchadnezzar's image was a, a, an image of himself. <laughs> okay, that's humanism to the nth degree. But you shall make for yourself no graven or carved image or any likeness that is in heaven above, the earth beneath, or is under the water in the earth. So what's that saying? Birds of the air, fish of the sea, anything on creepy thing on land, <laughs> you shall not make that. And uh, I know when we were studying the prophetic, uh, it always reminded me of Ezekiel 14, verses 3 and 4, about a graven image. The Lord said in Ezekiel, if anyone comes to me or seeks the prophet with an idol in their heart, I, the Lord, will answer according to the idol in the heart. Which really means God's not going to lie to you, but he's going to let you believe where you chose him over you, you will believe that interpretation. Have you ever heard anybody say, well, God told me, 
you know, to shoot my wife or something like that. And you go, well, gee, that's not scriptural. No, 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 God told me. All right? You end up getting to the place where the darkness in your heart, you will, you will even have the audacity to say God said. There's even milder versions of that. The one I know that Jennifer gets triggered on every now and then is when uh, anything experientially that people don't understand, I'm talking Christians, if they don't understand, like Dennis will say, uh, out of the uh, uh, innermost being, you know, drop down to your spirit. No, that sounds new age to me. You start calling new age, you start calling the Holy Spirit the devil, and you're standing on pretty shaky ground. A wise Christian would say, I don't know if that's true, but wisdom will search out the matter. I'm going to find out. Because right now, people throw away opinion. All you have to do is look on Facebook, you see opinions. You know? And people need to be more careful with their opinions. And why not search out the matter? Isn't that what the, what the scriptures would recommend? Search it out if it's God or not. But don't just sit there and label people and ministers and everything with your opinion. It's far too common. Far too common. There's more negative on Facebook than there is positive issues. And I understand. I can understand to a degree because, you know what, there's crazy stuff going on. And it is darkness. Tremendous darkness in our government. Tremendous. Tremendous darkness in areas that should have great influence in our lives. It's to the point where people don't trust medicine. They don't trust... Uh, they don't trust their doctors anymore with the COVID. They don't trust any of this stuff. All of a sudden, there's, a, there's a, an emphasis on the darkness. And interestingly enough, there is what people, is there such a thing as a conspiracy? Yeah. But when it's rampant, <laughs> it's probably some truth, <laughs> Right? Everything that's a conspiracy theory, some of these things have proven to be true. So I think we need to seek out the matter in light of the Holy Spirit and not of just opinions. No graven image, no idol in the heart. And you know what? If you have an idol in your heart, you're set in your opinion, then you will get validation for that lie. You'll get confirmation. Better to search out the matter and purify the heart. Every good and perfect thing that comes from above is first pure. If it's not pure, you're going you're gonna to make bad choices, have bad concepts. Now, the next thing is, we know the warning of no graven image. We know that you don't want to be seeking God or the prophets of God with an idol in your heart. But it says, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4, Christ is the image of God. And listen to what Paul's saying in Corinthians. But even if our gospel is veiled, even if our gospel is veiled, it's to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age blinded. If, you, if, if the enemy can get you to agree with him, it blinds your thinking. It blinds your mind. And the God of this age is blinded who does not believe, lest the light would shine. And if that light of the glory of the gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, might shine on them. Can you see the benefit of searching a matter out? It's the wisdom of kings to search out a matter. And don't be so quick with your opinion. Wait and see how your heart feels pure in your opinion. Do you feel that you are inquiring and seeking God on it? No. If Christ is the image, Satan blinds the unbelieving, but the light of Jesus should be shining on the heart. So Christ is the image of God, and he could and should shine on us. Now, here's the part that 
has always been important to me. Anything in the scripture, like like I said, my railroad track scripture was Philippians 3.10. Jennifer's was Jeremiah. I know the plans that I have, 29.13. And if you write a scripture down, it could be an indicator of a particular scripture that God knows you. He knit you together in your mother's womb, and he knows you better than you know yourself. It could be that he will use some of those things that have a lot of light on them to get you back in the light. Go back and see if you're doing that scripture, those scriptures, whatever. Uh, the, the beauty of it for me was that I might know him, that I might progressively become more intimately acquainted with the wonders of his person. There was a season where I took all the names of God and spent months on each name, lived it out over a period of years. I wanted to walk with it, and I wanted to have an awareness that I was in that, I understood that relationship with God, not just because I memorized, you can go to Bible college in the first year, they can teach you all the names of God, and you can memorize them. That's nice. You got to start somewhere. But are you walking in those names? Are you walking in, in the creator God, the God of power and might? Are, is, create, is the God who is a covenant-making God, are you walking in that covenant with him? Does covenant mean anything to you? El Shaddai, the God who is more than enough. And I always tell the story how uh, God got my attention with that one, El Shaddai, the God who is more than enough. I had a, this sounds silly, but as a young Christian, I had a problem with the multiplying of the loaves and the fishes that there was leftovers. I thought my God should be precise, and it should have been absolutely provision. And that's when God had to say, yeah, Dennis, we got to clear up some of your darkness here. Yeah. God is precise. <laughs> he doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't count wrong. But he says, your God is the God who is more than enough, the God that overflows. Your cup runneth over. That's not wasteful. That's an extravagant, loving Father God. And you're missing the extravagance of his love towards you, and you're looking at the precision of the counting. What are you? Are you going to be an accountant, an auditor? What you, what, what, what's your problem? That is... I guess I needed the light to shine in my darkness on the wonderful, extravagant love of the Father who is not wasteful but overflows. My cup runneth over. Ah, surely goodness and mercy shall follow after me and overtake me all the days of my life. All right, so now the experience of Christ as the image, he should shine on our heart. And I would take the scripture, and again, if it has revelation, all of you, in your daily reading of your Bible, if something stands out, that is not a coincidence. That's not just an intellectual point of interest. If something stands out or is quickened or is made alive, that's God saying, I'd like to shine this on your heart. Could you stay there a minute? Could you stay there a minute? Could you stay there two minutes and let it shine upon your heart? And as it shines upon your heart, I will be, you will become a partaker of that divine nature and that light will dispel the darkness and I will take you into deeper understanding that I might know him, that I might progressively, there's that word again, progressively become more intimately acquainted. You haven't arrived yet. Neither have I. We need to progressively pursue him. It's not a casual walk in the park. It's supposed to be a passionate relationship. Now, here's another thing. <clears throat> Something uh, that's always been important to me is I saw that the Word was living and powerful in Hebrews 4.12, but in 4.13 it really opened my eyes to say, it didn't say all things are naked and open to the eyes of the Word. It said all things are naked and open to the eyes of Him. And treating the Holy Spirit as a person, and treating the Word of God as Jesus and His Word. Jesus said, I am the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Personalizing that relationship rather than thinking it's mere information. And when I did that, I saw that the express image 
is the voice of the Father. Listen to this, Hebrews 1. God, verses 1 through 3, who at various times and in various ways, he spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets. He spoke by the prophets. They had the word of the Lord for the people. He says, but he has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image. So that means he demonstrated his essence was expressed. Expression is created in the image of God, and he made Jesus the express image of his person and the express image of the Father. And that's when I saw way back then with this verse that we are under the government of voice. If the Word of God is supreme and the Word of God is a person, we are under the government of the King of Kings, but he is also a voice. And he speaks. And as a king, you're to obey. God spoke in various ways, and he still speaks in various ways, dreams, uh, all different methods. But the point is that he is the express image of the Father. And one of the things that stood out to me uh, Years ago, it was in Deuteronomy 13, where it talked about the false prophet. And I thought that chapter was on the false prophet until I kept reading it. It said, that if your brother, your mother, all of a sudden it was family. If anybody tells you to go serve another god. So I said, the enemy is not your family. The enemy is not the false prophet. The enemy is the voice. And that under the government of voice, we shouldn't be listening to any other voice, but we should be aware of those voices and how they come across. He says, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. There's other voices you shall not. There's five things he said, you shall not consent. Don't listen to that voice. You hear voices in your head. But if you know it's not the new creation reality, you know it's not Jesus, you know it's not scriptural, then you don't consent, don't listen, don't pity, don't spare it. You know, we have unsanctified mercy sometimes. Oh, well, but they love each other. No, they're in sin. <laughs> All right? Do not conceal, but rather, what did it say to the false prophet? It said, put it to death. I say, what really needs put to death is the voice. You know, you need to know how to experientially bring every thought, every voice captive to the obedience. Nullify it. Render it dead. Now, under the government of voice, the express image is the voice of the Father. All right. The express image reveals the Father. And you've heard this often in the church. But I think there's an expression and demonstration that need to be combined more fully with our understanding. We know more Bible than we know. That I might know him, that I might progressively become more acquainted. There's going to be scriptures showing up in the days ahead and the months ahead that God's going to shine his light on it. You may have known it your whole life, but suddenly it's going to impact you because the light's shining in darkness right now. There's a lot of darkness in the world. But shouting at the darkness, yelling at the darkness, is not accomplishing anything as much as let your light shine. Look at, look at in, the, in Judges. Smash the pictures. Light shined in darkness. And the enemy confused itself. That's the emphasis I'm trying to get across this morning. I, I, we all have opinions. I, I, I mean, I see so much junk in the news, so much that I disagree with and it grieves me, but shouting at the darkness isn't going to do as much good as letting my light shine. Because when light shines in darkness, the enemy gets confused, but you win. The express image reveals the Father. John 14, 9, Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So why do you say, show us the Father? 
If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He was the express image of the invisible God. What part are you missing, Philip? And he expressed and revealed the Father by the life that he lived, by the death that he died, by the things that he did. It was his total essence, his image and his likeness, the way he functioned. All right. Now, how did this all get started? Let's get start with your born again experience. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Okay. What happened when I got born again? Well, I said a prayer. Yeah. But here's what happened experientially. God became your father. You entered into a new family. Uh-oh. He looks at us through Jesus, because now we're a new creation. They that are joined to the Lord are what? One spirit with him. The son who is in the bosom of the father, that means the son who is, has intimate, is intimately present with the father. He's declared him. He's revealed him. He's explained him. The awesome wonder of the father has been expressed through him. Jesus and his word are one. The word was God. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. In the beginning was that word. That word was God. That word was God. It's a life-giving word, and it's a quickened word. And I'm telling you, you watch. But in the days ahead, there is so much darkness. Instead of yelling at the darkness, get the scripture that God is speaking to you and stay there until it shines. Until it shines on your heart, but through you. It has to be an expression or a demonstration, not just a no-so. I'm telling you, you're going to be better off. You know, I can't look at a news article without seeing the lies. The lies are everywhere. So what do I do? Argue with them? You know, when you have a mental stronghold, and that's what the enemy's trying to do, he's trying to take all of the negativity to get you into your opinion mode so he can make it a stronghold. There's so much negative going on right now, it wants to become a stronghold in your thinking. It wants to exalt itself against the knowledge of God. It's a distraction. So instead of shouting at the dark, Let's start being the light and letting the light of whatever God's saying in the midst of it. And when God starts shining in that light, you know, uh, what God was speaking to us, I'm hanging on to in the midst of all the darkness and all the junk that's out there. What did God tell us, Jennifer? Same time, simultaneously, independently of each other. Watch what I will do. I'm staying there. And I've already seen some pretty unlikely things transpire. And it's only the beginning. Watch what I will do. I'm staying there. Now, watch what the devil's doing and analyze it and complain about it. Because any, anybody could do that. You don't even have to be a Christian to do that. But God's saying, I was born again, not of corruptible, but incorruptible. So God is my Father. Jesus and His Word are one. And now he's saying, guess what? You are born again with a seed. What does that imply? You are born again by incorruptible seed. Seed means it might have everything that's necessary in it, but it's still a seed. Seed has to grow. And the beauty is I believe God's going to bring us into deeper levels of a work of the cross to go from the child to the young man to mothers and fathers. Because quite frankly, when, unless the grain of wheat fall in the ground and die, what does it do when it dies? <laughs> vulnerable. Then what's it do? It goes down before it goes up. Our, our, our next book that's coming out is taking all of our drop-down stuff and changing it to the secret place. <laughs> kind of tricky, but people like, people like drop-down, where's that in the Bible? I don't know. 
you know. Actually, drop down is in the Bible in a place that you ignore. In the Greek, it's put on. Look at Thayer's Greek dictionary. Put on. Put on the Lord Jesus. Put on the new man. Put on, put on, put on, put on, put on, put on. That means to sink into in order to be clothed. To sink into in order to be clothed. It's kind of like baptism where you go into the water immersed to be clothed. Because if you sink down and you relate to he who has been made peace for you, he has become your peace. Peace resides in you. That peace guards what? Your heart and your mind. Well, gee, that's all of you. Your heart and your mind. You're guarded by the peace of God. That's militant. That is not passive. Now, you are born again by this incorruptible seed. But then... Then the scripture has to, just when I thought I arrived and I got born again, and I was going to camp out there and just read my Bible and learn more stuff. Instead, he says, and now as we have borne the image of the man of dust, <laughs> we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man now and in heaven. But the implication is put off the old image, put on the new image, and duo to sink into in order to be clothed. I have to put off, put on. Oh man, that means I gotta grow. I like the seed part. I'm born again, everything's covered. Don't I look like everything's covered? <laughs> oh man, I got ways to go here because the old image has to come off and the new image. And you know what? The process in between is one of being renewed in the spirit of your mind. Ephesians 4, 22. If you're being renewed in the spirit of your mind, the problem that we've seen in a lot of interpretation, we are so exalting reason that when we see the word mind, we only think of thoughts. That word mind in the, is noose, N-O-U-S. Noose is mind, will, and emotions. If all three aren't in agreement and they're not under the authority of the, of the supernatural power of God on the, inside of you, they're like three bad kids, mind, will, and emotions. And they'll, they'll agree. They'll go run off and do something contrary to God. God expects us to move in a progressive revelation. What was the railroad track scripture that changed my whole life and actually produced all the how-tos? That I might know him, that I might progressively become more intimately acquainted. That hunger and that thirst can never die. And now, lately, I've been, after all these years, I'm, Jesus is the promised land. That's really, uh, Jennifer's message really touched home with me. I love it. I'm going to walk with him. I'm going to know the difference between wheat and barley and how that applies out of a relationship with God. I'm going to know the difference between milk and honey and how that results in a relationship with God and how I can, how I can endeavor to know him more intimately and get more acquainted with the wonders of his person. And you know what the Bible calls it? The unsearchable riches. That means I'm never going to have all, but I'm not stopping. I'm going to get all that I can get. The unsearchable riches. Wow. I think that was Jennifer's last message. The unsearchable riches of Jesus is our promised land. Okay, so here we go. Now i got to close here with how to do this. <laughs> all right. So we understand that we're to gird up the loins of our mind, be sober, rest your hope, rest your hope. Hope and an open heart is synonymous. Hope is not just a word from the dictionary. Hope is a supernatural experience. Faith, hope, and love are supernatural. Hope is the ability to hold the heart open till love comes through. And that's not your timetable. That's not your direction. That's your ability to hold the heart open till Whoa. whatsoever. Soon. <laughs> then you're really walking in hope. God's going to return soon. So hold your heart open until then. Well, that means I better just continually do this. I better just remain open to God, open to life, open to one another. Shutting down is like crimping the hose. It's stopping the flow of Jesus. When you put up a wall, you're stopping the flow of Jesus. You're saying, I'll take care of this myself. I'll protect myself. I'll search myself. I can't think of anything. Don't you love it? 
what people say, if you've ever read some Christian, you know they really need some work. You know, it would be really nice to help them along and disciple them a little bit. And they go, I don't need any of that. I already did everything. I already, I've forgiven everybody. All right? That's when you need to show them the Jahari window. Remember Joe and Harry? Joe and Harry's window. It's that there are, at any given moment, which is where they're proud of their thought processes, there are 2,000 thought processes going on any given second. You know, I'm standing on my feet. I don't want to lose balance. It's, uh, it's cool in here. It's hot in here. Uh, I've got seven minutes before I have to finish. And uh, I got this and that. And, and then I can't wait to go eat because my stomach's growling. And we're going to go see Sid and have lunch pretty soon. And 2,000 a second. But in the, listen to this, in the non-conscious, 400 billion. And I get so weary of people searching their hearts. You can't, you come up with those 2,000 things. You don't know anything. The God who knit you together in your mother's womb, you let him search your heart. Be God's search instead of man's search. Man's got all kinds of counseling opinions. But God knit you together. If there's any tangles, he will take them out in precisely the, the procedure that's necessary. And he knows what's going on in the 400 billion. So when you say, I can't think of anything, that is a person hiding from the light. When a person says, I can't think of anything to deal with, they're hiding from the light. They're, they're self-searching, and that is not God-searched. Self-searched is navel-staring. God-searched is being vulnerable and opening the heart and say, God, you can go wherever you want. You pick the cherry, so to speak. You just take, you, you let... I let you go wherever you want, your Lord. And you know the 400 billion non-conscious thoughts. So how dare any Christian say, I can't think of anybody, I've forgiven everybody. Your little pea brain intellect at best has 2,000 thought patterns at any given second, and most of them are non-redemptive. <laughs> the stuff God wants, David was smart when he said, search me, O God, for any anxious thoughts, hurtful ways. What do you see there? Emo cognition, emo volition. Hurtful, anxious. What's that? Are those emotions? Anxious. What kind of thoughts? Anxious thoughts. You don't deal with the anxious, the thought's not going to change. Choices, hurtful choices. You don't deal with the hurt and the bad you're going to make bad choices. It is God who is at work in you both to will and to do, but you've got to surrender to that. Otherwise, you make hurtful choices. Then David said in Psalm 19, one of our favorites too, search me for secret faults. Duh! If David has God to search him for secret faults, what makes you think you don't have any? He said, search me for, but here's the wisdom in the application. He said, search me for secret faults that I might not commit greater transgression. Ah, even the rabbis taught fences, like adultery and murder don't fall out of the sky. It's lust that's not been dealt with can lead to adultery, and anger that's never dealt with to murder. Fences were deal with it when it's small. And God's saying, I don't want to cre create presumptuous, blatant, ungodly sin. So search me, O oh God, for secret faults, things that would lead up to me. And by the way, everybody has blind spots. The bad part about, this is humbling, the bad part about blind spots is other people can see them, but you can't. <laughs> oh, that ought to keep us humble at least, right? <laughs> You mean other people can see, mm, yeah, they can. And you can't, no, you can't. That's why it's called a blind spot. And if you've lived that way long enough, you just say, well, that's the way I am. That's a good blind spot. Now, here's the way that transformation takes place. In the next few minutes, you need to understand that when the word is shining on your heart, it starts as an imprint. That imprint later 
becomes some kind of a representation. Like, I always use the example of my cousin. My cousin had a certain kind of walk. Uh, his father and, and mother were divorced, and he never saw his dad for many years. And when I saw his dad, my uncle, walk, and I saw my cousin walk, they looked the, they looked the same. Father and son, they had the same all right, representation. But God's saying, I want you to go from an imprint to some kind of representation of a believer to full stature. And uh, Jennifer discovered years ago, four predestined, uh, at least in the New King James translation, four predestined in the New Testament. And all, free, all four predestined shows you the way we were meant to change. You were predestined to be conformed to his image. You were predestined to be called in a relationship, father, son, changed into his character and likeness. Thirdly, you were called to function. We always say Sabbath sons, Sabbath sons and Sabbath daughters. Those who have learned to walk in the peace of God and entered into that rest of faith as an experience. And lastly, to reproduce according to kind. So you were called to a relationship. You were called to character development or his nature. You were called to function in the peace of God. And you were called to reproduce according to kind. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creations. We must bear that image and grow in that image. The man in the mirror. Here's where we started. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask. He gives all men liberally without reproach. But let him ask in faith, no doubting, because you'll be two-faced. A double-minded man is unstable. It's like being two-souled, two-minded, two-faced. Two and God wants you to be stable, because you have a choice to be stable or unstable. Double-minded means like Jekyll and Hyde. All right? Find out and let God search your heart to eliminate that. Destroy the false image, imaginations, idols, high things that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And I'm closing with the same scripture that I started with. James 1:22. But be a doer of the word and not a hearer only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his Genesis face in a mirror. He observes himself and goes away and forgets the kind of man he was. But he who looks into the law of liberty and continues in it, continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer, demonstrator of what change has taken place, this one will be blessed in everything that he does. So we thank you, God that we're going to begin in the days ahead to look into the mirror of the Word and let you change us, remove the darkness, and shine your light in our hearts through the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.